I figured it would be really cool to get everybody together and and kind of talk about the connection between music and theater and how you guys each do it mm-hmm. a little bit differently. Because uh, I, I just think it's really interesting. And I don't know anything about musical theater. It was never something I got into, to be honest, until really listening to Charming Disasters, Our Lady of Radium album. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I never imagined wow. that 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 we would be a gateway drug in yeah. that way. <laughs> so funny. <laughs> so it, it's, I mean, it's really, I, I like because I always equated it with things like Grease, Bye Bye Birdie, and much as I love Paul mm-hmm. Lind, I it's it mm-hmm. goes a little over the top for me, and that's what I liked about what you guys do. And Esther, what, you, what your album is had done is not go over the top. You know, it wasn't super mm-hmm. silly or, or, or campy. It was it was fun. Charming disasters, especially. Esther's yours yours goes fun and but sometimes dark. So yeah, maybe a little more dark than fun. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but the live show is the live show has a lot more fun. I think the album has some fun in it too. But the live show has even more. But yeah. So what I wanted to do is kind of to start off by finding a little bit about about how you guys got into that type of music in the first place. I mean, was there, I, I know musical theater and music and theater aren't always the same thing. Right. So no. I'm curious to know if you're drawn to one more than the other and how you got into it in the first place. What Was there a, a performance that you saw or was it uh, Esther in the case of somebody, maybe it was somebody you performed with or you know, just being in the, that being in the family. So, and, and in fact, Esther, why don't we start off with you since, you know, you're kind of born into musical theater. How Was that how you got into it and how you... Well, not musical theater. I actually, I, I hate musical theater pretty much, <laughs> like for the most part. Like I, and I call my show an anti-musical, but, but I don't hate anything, but you know, like I, but I grew up in theater and I grew up around music. I love music and I love theater when it's good, um, sure, right, which yeah. is not that often. Um, <laughs> I, I don't love the traditional tropes of theater, but I've been around some very adventurous theater makers growing up. So, and I love film too, which is also a little bit part of like my, my aesthetic, I think is very cinematic in a way. And I actually use projection in my show. But anyway, I just, I love song. I love music. That's probably my first love now at this point in my life. And, and, but theater and making something lot happen live is, is what I grew up around. And the two are not even, to me, a concert, a really good concert is theater in a way. Um, I can see that. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, there's something similar going on there. So, so this is my most ambitious project for me. It's just combining all those elements, you know, telling a story in a, in a not linear straight ahead square kind of way and telling it through song and the revisiting my old theater background. And it's kind of about that. It's very meta because it's, it's doing something with the means that it's about it's about growing up around music and theater actually Mm -hmm. Uh, so kind of the perfect medium to tell the story exactly it's really interesting it's it's a fascinating concept and a fascinating album so so jeff and elliot what what about you guys was there something that really clicked with you to get you into it i mean i i can go first um for me, musical theater is kind of the music of my childhood. Like my parents, their, their tastes are pretty, were fairly broad. And so growing up, there was a lot of like Beatles and classic rock and there's a lot of folk music, but there was uh, an awful lot of musical theater, which is like great music to listen to as a kid, because like it tells a story and like, you know, you can kind of imagine what's happening. And, you know, as I, as a somewhat relative, like as a relatively melodramatic child, like I really liked the idea of just sort of like breaking into song and like narrating your like day-to-day doings through, through a sort of song form. So 
and you know that's like everything from cats and lamas to like guys and dolls and the pajama game and i mean like there's different eras of musical theater and i mean like esther like i wouldn't say that like i am like a fan of musical theater per se like i find it's like it kind of um Mm, goes toward the middle brow maybe a little bit like it like there are these heavy-handed tropes and you know and, and it's the sure. the stylized nature of it is like pretty ridiculous but there's some great music there's some great songs i mean guys and dolls for instance is probably that's probably my favorite show for songs like they, there's just such great songs in that show uh, maybe that was my problem I was, I was getting too distracted from the music by everything else that was going on yeah, I recommend just like listening mm-hmm. without watching because okay. uh, it 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 takes away a leather a layer of the the sort of over the top right. artifice. I don't know. <laughs> so Jeff, what about yeah, and I? What about you, I never really listened to musical theater growing up. It was something that I really didn't like. I mean, I like Fiddler on the Roof and the songs and and like there's some musical theater songs that kind of filter into the American songbook, which are really beautiful and cool. And, you know, the sound of music has got a lot of great songs that as a kid, you're like, Oh, this is great. You know, yeah. Doe, a deer, female deer, all that's all that stuff that like Elliot said, it's really great for kids and it's a great songwriting also. And it tells a story. Um, and then I kind of like poo pooed it and was like, Oh no, musical theater. It's like, it kind of evokes a certain style and and it's very uncool it's very uncool (laughs) so i was trying to be as cool as possible like being a musician musician so i stayed away from it until i think once we started driving a lot in the car together and elliot i don't know it was on one of your dad's mixtapes or something that was like he would he would put in some some tasteful musical theater numbers and i was like oh this is a great song. Yeah, and, I feel you know, like we need to shout out my dad at this point. My dad for yeah. many years has had a tradition of creating themed mixes, which he burns onto like dozens of CDs and distributes to all of his acquaintance um, <laughs> for the holidays. And um, he usually includes one of our songs or my songs. And he often includes uh, some musical theater stuff along with rock and roll and R and B and all kinds of other stuff. Mm. So he, he just like sneaks it in. It's like, you know, <laughs> carrying the broccoli into the Milo or whatever. That is awesome. And, Love your dad. And as, and as like a duo uh, coming up with interesting ways to ha- present two sides of a story or, you know, some counterpoint or some other things where we're both singing at the same time, but perhaps different, like different words and musical theater you know, in, when it's done well, it could, it could do that so well. And, you know, it is inspiring, like having people arguing with each other or something in song, you know, and, you know, you can kind of, you know, it makes these cool harmonies sometimes and you can kind of follow both things and the story gets pushed along. Like, Oh yeah. And and when you borrow that, and when you borrow those tropes from musical theater and put them into like pop or rock people, like people lose their minds. They're like, Oh my God, like, what are you doing? And you're like, Oh, it's just, it's like a counterpoint thing, but like, it's just not done as much in, in like popular, you know. Uh, And also I just wanted to say one thing, like the origins of theater is, is, totally enmeshed in music. I mean, that's the original, you know, Greek chorus, actually, you know, a chorus is, was an actual chorus and there's lots of song right. and singing in that. So that is, it is linked inexorably and whether we come apart from it or, you know, revisit it, there's, there is something magical about music and theater together. It creates this kind of landscape or this you're creating, it's like, you're creating a world, you know, and it is something about those things together is, is very generative. You know? Absolutely. I mean, even in the theater, I, I, I grew up in music was a huge part of it. Like it was yeah. really, it, I, I think, you know, my aversion to musical theater, if I really think about it is, yeah, it's a little overdone and schlocky and there's a lot of tropes, but to me, it really comes down to just the singing. Like if the singing was was yeah. not normal, mm-hmm. 
singing. Yep. Totally. Not musical theater singing. I might love musical theater. Yeah. Why right. did you ruin it? Why did they screw well, up with this? Well, and, and then you have creators who are making like musical theater, like folk musical theater more recently, like Hades Town, which like is so incredible. And um Heather Christensen has done some really interesting stuff too, where like the music sounds like you know, music, not like right. Broadway show music. It sounds yeah. like, like yeah. musicians. And I think music. that makes all the difference to me. Yes. I, yeah, I'm exactly. not familiar with Hades Town. I've you should check it out. There's there's multiple versions. It started out as a concept album, actually, and Anais Mitchell recorded the tracks with you know musical collaborators like Bonnie Vare and like is Ani DeFranco on some of that too? Like, oh, right? Wow. And so. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsors. Before you skip over this ad, give me one minute. Like most podcasts, I pick sponsors carefully and I use the products that advertise here. Pure Spectrum CBD is a product that has been really beneficial for me. They have a wide variety of great products that can be used on a daily or as needed basis. I've been using the tincture every day and it's been wonderful for easing anxiety. And I absolutely love the isolate. I use it instead of acetaminophen or ibuprofen, and it's worked so well for the relief of aches and pains. They also have soaks, lotions, salves, gummies, and more, plus an entire line for fitness recovery. They even have products for your pets. See everything they offer at PureSpectrumCBD.com. And if you have questions, they're there to help. They helped me when I had no idea where to start. After you fill your cart, Use code PERFORMANCEANX for 15% off your purchase. Pure Spectrum CBD, Pure Spectrum CBD, Pure Spectrum CBD. Uh, so that's like the original songs. And then with uh, Rachel Chavkin, the theater director, uh, they developed it into a musical and it's been iterated a bunch. And there are some cast recordings over those iterations, which it's really cool. And actually, if you listen to the New York Theater Workshop version uh, and you hear everybody like yelling and screaming the audience and sobbing quietly, like we're, we're awesome. in there somewhere. Yeah. Oh. Sobbing. <laughs> oh, that is awesome. <laughs> so with yeah. everybody's I guess, early dislike of musical theater was was there a time when you consciously added the, the element of theater to the music you were writing let's say and i'm just going to use charming disasters last album like our lady of radium the whole it's it's a concept album and i know you guys would play it sometimes f- front to back in your perform was, was it more of a performance thing that you would start to add elements like maybe costumes and and theater makeup or were, were songs written specifically to be performed in a theatrical way. I, I don't know if I'm making my, if I'm asking a clear question here at this point, I feel like I garbled that one pretty good. No, I think I, I think I understand you. Um, I would say with more of our other, we, we write a lot of songs that tell stories. Yes. And whether it's over many songs, like with Our Lady of Radium and a longer arc, or if it's just with one within one song, there is a lot of storytelling and there's, drama. And because there's two of us, we try to amp up the drama as much as possible to kind of tell that story. But that said, Uh, like, we're not like, we aren't performing it as theater. Like we aren't embodying characters beyond like what's happening musically. We're not like changing our costumes or like putting on, like, we're not utilizing props. Like there are like theater tools that we're not using. Although, you know, like we've done some stuff with lighting, We've done some stuff with um, with projections. We've done some stuff with like kind of interstitial narrative um, where we kind of like contextualize the song in like a yes. sort of semi-dramatized way. But I'm not like, I'm Marie Curie. Right. Like, let me tell you about my life. Okay. Yeah. Esther, with the I Hate Memory album that you were yeah. playing, was that conceived to be uh, performed or uh, on a, in a yeah. theater? Okay. It was, but it did start with the songs. And I'm mm-hmm. always saying it starts and ends with the songs because the songs, everything is song. I'm, I'm a devotee of song. Mm-hmm. But I think for me, the transition is, is very much like you guys were saying that it really starts with the story, right? We're telling stories. That's 
the glue that holds the theater piece and the song piece together. And I, I started to feel like my my songs are telling stories, individual songs. And then with my last record before this, which was called Airless Midnight, I had a feeling that there was something about that record where the songs were collections in a bigger story. It was a little bit, not not a linear story, and not a, but it was an album to me, if I have to say what it was about, it was about grief. and. I started feeling like, oh, these songs go together, like like short stories maybe in a book or something. And I then started to feel the hunger for this bigger story to drive my songs or a bigger container, a bigger container to put my songs into. And then I got together with the Stu, who was, really, it was his idea that I do uh, uh, this this whole co- and anyway we started our collaboration of song and he said why don't you tell the story of your growing up in this crazy environment mm-hmm. and I said no way and he said why not and I said because I hate talking about myself and I'm not that into nostalgia and he said that's exactly why you should do it and then the rest that's it you know and then we wrote the songs and then I created the show around the songs mm-hmm. was that difficult to go into something knowing it was going to be a big production and knowing it was something that you don't like to do it, it, you know being nostalgic yeah it was but it was a really interesting challenge to find that like a way of talking about the past without being too nostalgic, a way of owning it, a way of deconstructing it. And it was an interesting challenge too, to create this bigger piece and starting with the songs, which were really, again, they were like little short stories of important memories that had some strong, emotionally potent content. Mm -hmm. And then kind of tying them together with monologues around it and images and other stuff. It's a very cool challenge. And it's great. And I know on the album, it's not the complete set of uh, of songs that, that are in the performance. Is it difficult to pick what stays and what goes when you're putting an actual album release out? Actually, it wasn't difficult. And there's only one song. There's a lot of other action and and moments and scenes that are, that obviously you can't put on an album but there's only one piece of music that's not on the album and it's kind of a spoken word piece and it was very easy to make the decision not to put it on the album because wait hey, it's kind of a spoken word piece I'm not going to torture listeners <laughs> but also also because it is the one piece that takes us out of New York it's a very New York story a very New York album but there's an interesting little episode Episode that's a detour and so it just didn't fit into the container of the album because that little detour is not does not take place in New York so okay mm-hmm. so I, ha- I have to step away for one second I have something in the oven I'll be right back <laughs> no problem <laughs> all right so <laughs> Jeff we'll, we'll continue with you you, you have to sure. back for both of you sure so when you guys play live let's I, I, I want to go back to the the last tour you guys did with supporting Our Lady of Radium we oh. are not doing the album in its entirety is it difficult to pick the other songs that you're going to because it's that whole album is a story in and of itself and when you're deciding not to do the whole story in and of itself you know you, you're obviously filling in with other songs is it yeah. a tough thing to to figure out not necessarily we've we've kind of like now we've assimilated those collection of songs into our repertoire and now they're just songs, you know, okay. that there's still, you know, there's the very specific moments that like, at least in my mind of, of the story that it's telling that as we're playing it, but they're now they're just songs in the repertoire and it's, it's pretty straightforward, at least for me, that's how it is. Is there the uh, possibility of playing well after you, know, you guys have a new album out is yeah. is playing an album front to back that's something that might come up again in the future obviously you're going to be focusing on on supporting the new album but uh mm-hmm. i don't even know what the hell my question is at this point <laughs> well i, I think uh, 
Well, I, I think I can answer the question maybe that you're you're getting at. So we we just we just released Supernatural History and we had a big album release show uh, last Friday. And we really wanted to make that a kind of immersive, slightly theatrical experience, even though it wasn't like that you're Esther, talking about the container. Like we definitely relate to that. Like before the concept album, like each of our songs kind of was its own universe. And we wanted like a bigger universe for all the songs to kind of talk to each other in, yeah. but we've gone back to like each song is kind of, kind of its own thing that the new album is more of a curiosity cabinet. It's like a bunch of stuff that like fascinates us. And like, that's the thing that connects it all. We did perform the album front to back um, for the release show oh, nice. and uh, which was really fun. And um, for the final number, we, we like really stepped it up a notch. We had these, um, these large cardboard, they call them flatsies in the puppet world. Um, so they're like, they look, they're like illustrations of our faces, but like this big oh, and nice. like, you know, like three times the size of our, of our faces. And we wore them to perform the, the last song of the set yeah. which is very difficult because you have to like wear them sideways and like pull the mic around because like <laughs> otherwise they're like blocking the microphone um uh oh, but you know no. it, was, it was very like klaus nomi like inspired like it was like very like exaggerated and you know so we, we are trying to like pull in elements that make it weird and not just like listening to an album you know or watching an album get performed when you did that did you play the entire album in in order we almost almost not quite we we switched a few things for like dramatic and logistical purposes so was the the last song with the the mask was that wrong way home no it was disembodied head (laughs) oh okay (laughs) wrong way home was one of my favorites on that on the the new album i love that song on your makeup and get on the stage tell a new tale every night stand still the sets and the scenery change are we just ghosts in the light of the ghost light why don't we take the wrong way home oh I'm glad you like this I think I think, you know, if someone were to, people have said like, oh, Charming Disaster, they're a a theatrical type folk goth band, or like they use, they use elements of theatrical elements in their performances. And it's, it's not because we have once in a while, we'll do a show where there's a lighting designer who can like change the lights for each song, or even if, if we have big cardboard heads on us, it's, I think what it is, is like our interacting with each other when we're on stage we're not just singing the song out to people we're like accusing each other of whatever it's happening in the song and i think that makes it a, it makes it more fun for for us right or at least for me i don't know about you Elliot, no, it's it fun. Makes, it, makes it more fun <laughs> and it's it's it poses a question like when you're watching someone on stage do something or interact with someone like theater a good theater does it, is you're you're waiting for the response you're like oh what's going to happen what's happening up there rather than like we're just downloading all these songs to you or like we're singing at you and we're you know emoting and doing all that stuff that people do and like but when there's like you know oh what's she going to do now like he said this thing to her like what's she going to do or he's you know we're running around the stage or something like that and that right or oh my god they've come off the stage and they're among us like yeah. what are we gonna do um <laughs> yeah i mean i think i think when like we talk about theater and our music we're talking about illegitimate theater as much as legit theater like we're yeah, talking totally. about vaudeville like that like that definitely like informs what we do and uh, you know we're entertainers like we are here to like make it interesting <laughs> illegitimate theater. i don't think i've ever heard that I, i'm not familiar with with that term uh-huh. It's yep. uh, Esther. I saw you nodding. <laughs> You're like, yep, that's legitimate. I mean, I mean, the thing is, too, like what you guys are saying is, it's the thrill of the moment, and and that's why I said earlier that a, a uh, really good rock show is kind of theater. Mm-hmm. It, you can feel that thrill of the moment and that thrill of what's going to happen next, and um. 
it doesn't even have to be huge. It doesn't have to be like Iggy Pop throwing himself, you know, bare chested into the mosh. It, it can even be something much small, smaller, more subtle. But there's this feeling of of what's going to happen next. And the more ways you can create that feeling on stage, the better. Yeah, I I think too about making it obvious that what you're doing is deliberate, that it's not and and I think that is that is something that sort of sets us apart in some ways from like more rock bands is that it's clear that we have rehearsed this stuff that like we're doing it on purpose, we're moving in a deliberate way, we're presenting it in a particular way. And I I think of our aesthetic as being somewhat presentational, like we are we're not trying to pretend like it's an accident and that we just like happen to do it like this. Like this is on purpose. Like, and like, maybe that's uncool. Like maybe that's uncool in the way that like musical theater is uncool because to be cool is to like be Aloof you know, affect movie. like an unstudied air, you know, you're like, Oh yeah. I just like rolled out of bed like this. Right. Um, and we're like, no, like we obviously did this makeup <laughs> on purpose you know, like, like we wear stage makeup when we're on stage. Like it doesn't look like normal people makeup. Like we're, we're larger than life. And I, I think that like makes the experience more interesting. That's a really yeah. good point. And you guys being, I guess, what, 99% of the time, just the two of you on stage, you know, you've got to be deliberate in what you do because there's the focus is always just on the two of you. You know, nobody can walk away for a, a five minute drum solo and then go fix right. things up. But there's other duos who are more like folky and more like unstudied. And it's, it's, I, I, you know, we, like we show up and we're like dressed for goth prom, basically. Right. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, you know, it's, there's an element of, I mean, we, we don't think of what we wear on stage as costume, but like there is like a, you know, again, like a sort of larger than life presentational uh, element to it. Mm-hmm. So does the, uh, and again, like, like you said, I hate to use the term costume, but is, is that deliberately chosen based on what you're, what you're uh, singing? What, and, and does it change often? It, it's depending on what the other person's wearing. Sometimes I get a call like, what are you wearing tonight? I'm, like, I'm going to wear, I'll wear blacks, I guess. I do blacks. Do you want to do pinks? No, let's save pinks. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It's, we we, we, did, we did do something a little special for our the Our Lady of Radium shows, um, which we we did in the Rochester Fringe Festival as a, like a sort of semi theatrical uh, production, and we I had a sort of fluorescent green petticoat under my dress instead uh-huh. of the like the usual black, and Jeff had um, matching socks. Oh, nice! You guys were lit up. <laughs> Yeah. That's right. I like it. <laughs> so, all right, Esther. And we've talked in the last time you were on and you know tonight about how you're not a, a big fan of, of nostalgia and, and musical theater and it wasn't exactly your thing. But when you put a production together, you've got to think about choreography or is that tough for you, it's for you to do in it when that's just really not something that you're a, a big fan of? I wouldn't say it's it's tough. I'm not you. Wait, be more specific. What what do you mean specifically? Choreography or um, you, it, well, when you I guess a better way to say it is if you're putting on a, a theater production, you know, there, there's the blocking and then there's also dancing. And, and if that's not what you know you've done for your your career, is it a, a difficult thing to transition into knowing that it's not your favorite? Genre well, of, I'm not going to put anything in the show that I don't love. I mean, I've made mistakes and I put things in that I thought I would love and then I ended up not loving or that maybe we didn't have time to fix right before the show. But if there's dancing in the show, it's because I love it. So <laughs> I'm not, I, it's not difficult. I mean, it's it's difficult to figure out. And and I actually did include a dance number in the show, and I'm I'm not even, I'm not sure if it's going to stay. But I I love dancing, you know. I I just am not going to make it the kind of show that that I don't love. I'm not going to have people sing in a Broadway musical style. That's not what I do. That's just never going to happen. 
I love creating this piece. It's really, really the best part. The, it's, it's, it's great. And there's a lot of str- efforting going into how to do it the right way. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsors. And, but, and, and that's because I really want to try to keep it from being very obvious what it, is this a musical? Is this a theater piece? Is this performance art? Is this a rock show? Like I want to kind of dance around all those things. Is this some kind of a weird mo- movie-ish thing? Because there's also projections and it's got a cinematic quality. So I want to kind of keep people a little bit on the edge of their seat wondering what medium is next or how but it's really fun to try to figure that stuff out so no it's not hard did you have all that in mind as you were writing what you know how you wanted the performance to look as a whole um it, it's still evolving okay by the way so we have yet to do a show in a real theater and this is destined for a theater at least one version of it so i think it can also live as a stripped down sort of song cycle it can it can do very well that way but I have yet to really kind of explode it in a theater with really going a little more wild with projections and so it's still evolving I'm sorry what was the question exactly (laughs) I feel like I didn't answer it I think I think you 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 did I I think I'm trying to remember what the question was is (laughs) when you were writing this and having this in mind did you have the performance in mind as you were writing right right I did I did, and it was really, you know, interesting because I have an aesthetic that it's in my songwriting and in my writing that I wanted to translate to a little bit more theatrical presentation. And also I have the aesthetic of, of the theater that was my family's theater, so that's in there too. So there's a little bit of that lineage that I'm carrying on, and yet this is definitely a more narrative situation it's not a straight ahead narrative but there is a little bit more of a narrative situation than than in those plays that i was growing up around so i had some ideas about incorporating all that but you know the fun is is kind of figuring out what you stumble upon right and playing with with these elements and and seeing what shakes out with the director with through rehearsals through some shows and some things work and some things don't so Esther, I am really curious about something. How what how big is the cast of your show? And are you performing in the show or are you like the musical director of the show? Yeah, I am performing. I sing all the songs and I actually tell the, most of the stories. I hate memory, I hate memory, I hate memory, memory's a predator. Too many memories mean to die. You're not now Memories, I'm scared of you You can say your memories From your deathbed And I play these little... I do a lot. <laughs> I play these little characters that that are... Uh, it's kind of hard hard to explain them. We're still figuring it out, but yeah, I'm, I'm in it. And so it's me and the band. And then there is... Uh, right now, the cast is me, the band. The band all has have small roles, so they kind of pop up in somewhat theatrical ways, but they really are, they're grounded on stage as the band. Mm-hmm. And then I have a sort of surprise heckler, interrupter, famous person guest. <laughs> uh, and then I have a young somewhat allegorical version of me on stage who says who speaks some of the parts uh she's a young teen she's 15 just turned 15 and she also is just a presence on stage because some of the stories are i feel a little hit a little harder and heavier when you see the the young person Mm -hmm. there so so that's the cast right now so cool when's your next performance I don't know. We just okay. did like a, a, a show at Joe's Pub 
and I've been working really, really hard this whole year. I had like a record release show on a bunch of shows at Joe's Pub, and I put out my album, and now it's sort of collecting the pieces on like what's next. And I think what I really am in need of is like a theater. Like I want to move into a theater now. We yep. we to try mm-hmm. the real theater space, which was always the plan. Mm-hmm. Cool. And you still have the same young lady playing that part who was uh, cast earlier when, when I had you on the first time? Is it still the same? Yeah, wait, when was that? You Oh, a few months ago. Yes, still the same person. I'm I'm like always telling her, stop growing up. You're going <laughs> to <laughs> I mean, she was, when we started working on this, we were, uh, it was before the pandemic, and we were supposed to sh- do it in a theater at that time at Dixon Place, and mm-hmm. that was in March 2020, so that's yeah. what happened then. But she was like 12 when we started. Uh, she she should start smoking so she doesn't grow. <laughs> <laughs> that's going to be uh, my favorite quote of this episode. So just joking. No. She shouldn't no one should smoke. No. Just joking. Well, uh, yeah, but I I smoked at that age, so she mm. Yeah. So oh, well, look at that. She's too smart. smart. <laughs> Wheels are turning now. So <laughs> all right, so Jeff and Elliot, the uh the new album is so much fun. It is really cool. You mentioned that it's a more of a collection of songs that each one tells its own story. But I know that there's a through line through the whole album i just based on the the title uh, you know is there something that connects all the songs together we jokingly called some of these songs the bad naturalist songs <laughs> <laughs> like like we're bad naturalists like we're we're like amateur scientists who like really are so interested in these things but are not like really experts in yeah. them yeah. and and that sort of like beginner's mind curiosity and wonder and excitement like you know i i think that that is sort of the thing that the sort of pulls the songs together i mean it's it's very much like our genuine attitude and especially as a duo you're constantly saying things like oh look at this like this is so neat or like i read this book you have to read it or i found this shiny rock like look at it <laughs> and you know and this album is sort of our extending that enthusiasm to our listeners like ooh, neat like you gotta look at this and it might be something from the natural world and it might be something more arcane and occult and you know, we, we have diverse interests, but it's, it all sort of comes under that umbrella and, and hence the album title. Like it's It's not just supernatural and it's not just natural history. Like it's both of those things kind of merged together. Well, that exactly, that comes together perfectly in the song Manta Ray. That's, that was <laughs> I mean, what you just described is that song is hilarious. I love it. Here's some amazing things about manta rays. They resemble magical flying carpets or mysterious capes. Some call them devil fish or eagle rays. Is that another name for them or just one kind? We're not sure. They are migratory over the ocean. What do they eat? Zooplankton. Exhibit a dark intelligence. They're saltwater dwelling. They can grow up to seven meters wide. That's 23 feet. I love it. I just kind of love the, the oh, it's like a call and response. And I love when Jeff's answer is just no. <laughs> Does the Manta Ray do this? No. It's two people very excited to be finally led into the, the lab at the aquarium and with, with you know, <laughs> outrageous expectations of what they might be able to do but and where they don't really know the facts of things but they're just interested in manta rays and and really right. enthusiastic yeah this this song actually originated as a list of things we knew about or discovered about manta rays when we were like i mean esther you must be familiar with this where like you've been in the recording studio for many hours and you're just like loopy and um we were in that place and we were like, I don't know, waiting for our, our recording engineer to like bounce a bunch of tracks or something. We're, we're just sort of like killing a little time. We're like, let's make a list about everything we can think of about manta rays. And like that list is essentially what became is essentially the, became the lyrics. The of, yeah. And some of them are facts and some of them are 
more like speculations, but it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, but it's nice to like, you know, have a song that, that, that can accommodate both facts and speculations with a sort of even handed attitude. Absolutely. Yeah. It's admiration and wonder, I think. And that epitomizes the whole, I think the whole album. And I remember <laughs> when you guys were on the last time we, you, you were telling me about a song you were writing about poison and I love Hellbore. Uh, oh, well, oh that poison song. Yeah. There's two songs about poison on this album. Oh. There's there's Hellbore, which is about poisonous or magical plants. Yes. But there's also Paris Green. Paris Green was an uh, was a poison, an agricultural and like um, like an herbicide, insecticide. It's an arsenic compound, oh, wow. and it used to be readily available like like mm-hmm. you know in the early part of the 20th century if you lived in like a rural place like you had a paris green in your shed because you were like putting it on the tomatoes or whatever um Doing but that, yeah. there were also a lot of murders and suicides that utilized paris green um, which we learned from a book called With wisconsin death trip which is uh archival photographs and archival newspaper clippings almost like a police blotter oh, from wow. this like deep rural wisconsin town around that time and we got really curious we're like what's paris green because you're looking through it and like it's like oh like so-and-so arson so-and-so suicide cause of death paris green and we're like what is paris green it sounds so exotic and beautiful it does Um, And so it's an arsenic compound, but arsenic was used in a lot of other things too, like, like textile dye and wallpaper. Like it, it makes a beautiful color and it's used, it's a color of paint. Like it's a paint pigment and they're all kinds of like really seriously toxic pigments that are still used in you know, in, in art. Um, and, uh, but Paris green made us think of Prussian blue, which is also used in forensic science to determine whether cyanide is present. And so Paris green and Prussian blue was a little like lavender's green, rosemary's blue and, and the rest sort of followed suit. Oh, this is what I love about your music. The most interesting song lyrics are so great. I always feel like I learned something when I listen to you guys. (laughs) <laughs> but my favorite amazing. my favorite on the album is definitely bat song mm. that is my absolute favorite song oh, that's on that so album. cool to hear I mean, it's oh, you know amazing. you write all these songs over like a long period of time and you put them out on an album and you really don't know which ones are gonna like stick with people like you don't know which ones are gonna mm-hmm. resonate you love them all you have feelings about them all but like and then you know you're like well like which one should be like the single or like should we make a video for like we don't know like we're just guessing and it's only after the album comes out and people start telling you how they respond to it but um that song has been the sort of surprise hit so far of this album it's the song that our fans seem to be really responding to the most and um and it's really touching because it's a song about like feeling alone and connecting with your people Mm -hmm. being an oddball It's a beautiful song, and it's it's one of the, my favorites of, 
that you've recorded. It's wow. Our Lady of Radium <laughs> and Bad Song are my my two favorites. Oh. <laughs> so well, thank you, thank you. Are you guys planning on taking this? Uh, on tour again soon or you know besides oh yeah oh, very soon oh. tomorrow morning in fact oh, we nice. from Mass- yeah we've got three shows in massachusetts this weekend and then um a week and a half later we leave for the west coast and we're doing uh, like 10 shows on the west coast between seattle and la oh, wow. um and then we'll go to the midwest in april and then we'll go to the south in may so we have like you know two dozen tour dates on the calendar right now and oh, fantastic. um so uh, and I let my 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 parents are coming to shows over the weekend because they they live in Massachusetts and my mom calls me she's like what time is the show on Saturday and I'm like I have I have no I have like like 24 like show dates like seven I think like let me call you back <laughs> there's oh. a website she should check oh yeah she'll she'll Google us but like, you know she wants to like check she's gotta go straight to the source man it's mom I'm like yeah. I know I'm like I'm like mom we have a website you know. Um, it's like, yeah, but no. I've got your phone number. It's true. Yeah. It's true. <laughs> so Esther went back and I was listening to the album again. And I'm still got to tell you, I still have my favorites. Like Campfire at the Chelsea, Before America, Privacy, and Nostalgia. Those are my top f- songs still off of that album. It's just, I really love that album. I bumped into Nostalgia on 23rd and 8th. As a boy, he was a big fat liar. Now he's a skinny man of faith. He worked his crew in a top 40 tune from a sweet gone summer sad. He looked better than I remembered. Huh. Guess we just checked out of rehab. It's a little bit different for me because it's got that little bit of a theatrical feel. Not like you were saying, not over the top, but it's, it, it's so much fun to listen to because fun, that's I guess, using that word. It's, it's, it's so interesting to listen to because of the story behind it. And it's really, I, I get sucked into it. I love to hear that. I mean, I mean, that's what I'm hoping. Like you don't necessarily get a straight up narrative from this record, but I do hope you get a feeling of a, of a, a world or, or something like that that you're invited into the atmosphere of a a little journey a little trip into this kind of intimate and unusual little world yeah and i love that it's self-aware like we were talking about the last time you were on privacy specifically you know it, it's very meta to survive gracefully the grotesque life tastefully requires the right to privacy a memoir? No way. That's like nails on a chalkboard coffin. It's too sad. You got something here we don't hear too often. So that's right. So in the key. With respect to privacy. It's an amazing song. I love it. So thank you. Yeah, it's it's like you know when I when I mentioned before that it was hard for me to take this project on at first because of those things like mm, I don't I don't really do memoir. Like that's not my genre and I don't really do nostalgia too much. Um and then Stu convinced me to do it anyway, but then I I was still haunted but haunted by these inner demons about it. And so then I was like, well, then I just got to put that in there too. Yeah. Now, are you concentrating on, on getting this into a theater or are you, are you writing more still or? I, I, I'm concentrating. I'm still revising. Like I re since our last show, I just rewrote the script. Uh, Not really, but like I changed some crucial things and I would love to tour it as a, as a sort of song cycle. And then I'd love to get a real run in a theater here and wherever else we can. So, but I really need help with that stuff. I can't do all of that on my own. So just trying to figure all that out. And I think, you know, we, we have a producer who's been helping us a little bit and my director, Lucy Sexton, who's great. She, she's, she's, uh, but we're just, you know, kind of getting our bearings after the last show, which we worked really hard for. And like, 
figuring out what the next steps are. I'm assuming because I I like it that it's getting a, a good response when you play. Yes, well, we we the shows went really well, and we uh, we we did have a really good crowd at Joe's Pub. The thing for me with this show is it's a lot of work, and I don't want to do one off shows like this. And plus, yeah. the stage and, and technical stuff there is not quite mm-hmm. enough. So yeah. We had a little bit of a rhythm for the past year of doing a show every two, three months. But like, but after this last one, I think we're all on the same page that we need to run. We can't, I can't do this amount of work and, and then have like one show and it's over. That's actually yeah. a really difficult experience. Oh, I can only imagine. Yeah. So how can people follow and, and find out more about it? Get the album? Um, the- yeah, the so the album is still pretty new. So, kids, get the album. It's out there on every <laughs> possible whatever digital. I don't have physical albums at this point, but um, and then in terms of dates, I will post them on my website. But I think the best place to follow my activities is on Instagram because that's what everybody does nowadays, right? Is yeah. post there. So right. once I know what my next is hopefully you know there'll be some live shows at the very least in, in, in late summer maybe out of town and then anything like a real run that probably won't happen for a little while just because of how scheduling and all that is but it, it might be in the fall anyway it'll all be on instagram oh perfect Love the shit out of it when it happens believe trust me <laughs> <laughs> much to my Here dismay you. i hate that part but. yeah i know what you mean but We'll get some, as much word out as we can, too. So, Jeff and Elliot, how about you guys? Where can people find the new album and catch you guys on tour playing Supernatural History? Sure. Well, Supernatural History is out um, as of a week ago on all the major platforms. Um, it's on Spotify and iTunes and Apple Music and all the places. Um, it's also out on vinyl and on CD, and people can get that through our band camp. Or actually, uh, we have a Shopify store now, too, which which uh, is connected to, uh, to Spotify. So if you're listening on Spotify, you can probably find the, the physical stuff, too. But you can find every uh, people can find everything on our website, which is charmingdisaster.com. Com. All of our tour dates are listed there. And as we announce more, those will show up there as well. Um, you can find us on Facebook and Instagram. Um, but it's, uh, it's we, we try to be in all the places all the time. Yeah, anywhere so you look. We're pretty easy to find. If you, if you, mom, if you Google us, like you will, you will find the yeah. show, the show. We could just call us up and ask us. <laughs> just, yeah, just call me. <laughs> now, I know you guys, when it first came out, had a, uh, tarot cards that were with this are there, is that still available oh yeah, oh, yeah. It's, it's an oracle deck it's a 60 card deck there's a card for each one of our songs that we have released to date so that's five albums worth plus about 10 singles um oh, wow. and uh two dozen artists we commissioned original art from them to to create this deck it's really pretty wow. um and we we printed 500 of them. Um, about half of those were spoken for by Kickstarter backers, um, and we're taking the rest with us on tour. So people can people can find them at the merch table. They're like really magical, special objects. Like they, they oh, and the coolest thing is that we've been hearing from our fans who have them already that they have been using them in their like cardamancy divination practice, and people are like these cards are great for that. Um, which I mean, it's really cool. Cause I mean, it's, it's also just an art piece. I mean, like it's all these like beautiful illustrations and it's connected to our like art decade worth of work. Um, but, um, it just is really delightful to hear that people are like doing kind of traditional tarot spreads using our cards and finding like meaningful insight through that. That's really wild. Well, that's pretty cool. Thank you so much. This is, this has been a very interesting episode. I wasn't really sure how, where it was going to go or how it was going to go. Cause I didn't know anything about this topic anyway. And I think, I think we made it pretty fun. Yeah. It was really oh, nice yeah. talking with, with you, Esther. And yeah, um, totally. I, I definitely want to check out your, your Me, album. When are you guys playing yeah. in New York? Sorry, my camera's going crazy. When are you guys playing in New York? Um, well, not for a while. Probably we, we just did a show last week. And, uh, we'll probably be back in like June in New York. 
Okay, when was where was your show? Oh, we did it at at Caveat. Do you know Caveat? Mm-mm. It used to be the Living Theater on Clinton Street, like down the stairs, and it's become this really nice venue where they do mostly like mostly storytelling and comedy, but it's sort of got like a nerd culture vibe, which is good for us. And they have a really great technical director and Mm -hmm. it's perfect if you're a band that doesn't need like bass amps and a drum kit which we don't need um but yeah but it's it's a really nice room and they're great to work with and it's like it's got like a little cabaret vibe it's really nice cool and if you guys come to the dc area i've got to check out a show because i want to hear how supernatural history gets pared down a little bit since you guys don't tour with the drummer and i I, i'm really interested oh well well, good news, Mark. We are coming to Baltimore on April 26th, and we're coming to D.C. on June 2nd. Oh, all right. I'll have to put that in the calendar. So write that down. Awesome. Well, I will check out the <laughs> website to remind myself oh, yeah. of those yeah. dates. Yeah, it's it's all there. All the links. <laughs> Hearing that, Mom? <laughs> all right, guys. Thank you so much for all this. It's been a pleasure talking to you guys again. It's always fun to have you get both, all three of you on. And uh, we should so definitely much. do it again. Great. Yeah, we would love that. Yeah. Really nice to so meet great. you, Esther. And thanks nice so much, you, Mark. It was a pleasure right. chatting with you. My pleasure. Be safe on tour and, and good luck with everything. And Esther, good luck with the, the theater. And uh, I'll be Thank keeping you. an eye I'll out for it. Good. Bye. 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 Bye, everyone.